Arunda Braha Baba. Can you bless the name of the Lord wherever you are? Just thank him, thank him. It's worthy to be praised, it's worthy to be lifted. Rabananto Vrehisko Barabinanto Vrehiba Baba. Embra Fananto Sika Balabire de Benekoska Baba. Embra Fananto Skabelento Brehiba Baba Baba. Father will bless you, Father will bless you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your instructions. Thank you for always sending your word to us. Thank you, O God. Thank you for exposition. Thank you for illumination. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for growth. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for the gift of your presence. For we have not gathered in vain. We have not gathered in vain. Maroma kabane koma subalia na pele koma na ba. We have not gathered in vain. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of your presence. Le rabakama ne koba la vires kabile no mama. Embre koba luz kabibi anoba na koba lia da baba. Eramba ma koba lante su kabile da ba. Ero kapa la to kapa raba baba. Ria baba baba ya to ma koba telia. Eros kapa balento biraho ma kabila le da ba. Eros kapa babia reba bampe ko. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let your name be praised, oh God. Let your name be lifted, oh God. In Jesus' name, we are free. Can we have our seat in God's presence? Let's have our seat. Let's have our seat. Father, we thank you because you are always here with us. Thank you for your instructions that we always enjoy. Once again, we pray that you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, that you touch our hearts even to receive from you this day in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we welcome someone close to us and say, you are welcome to God's presence. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, today, uh, we'll be looking at the sure mercies of David. The sure mercies of David. Hallelujah. I want us to pay attention to this teaching. It's, it's going to be a transformative teaching. Anyway, the word of the Lord that has been coming to us each time we meet has always been transformative. But today, I believe there is something that God wants to teach us in a strange dimension. So I'm going to encourage us to ensure that our heart is open to receive and then we shun all distractions so that we can receive from the Lord maximally, even as the Lord will be unveiling mysteries for us today in the name of Jesus. Once again, the Lord will open our eyes to see, and the Lord will open our ears to hear in the name of Jesus. The sure mercies of David. Um, let's quickly open our Bible to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 from verse 1. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to what? To faint. Saying, there is a city, there is in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded what? Man. Praise the Lord. Now, Jesus wanted to teach the disciples something. Then he told them, he said, uh, in a city, he was trying to teach them using parables. Are you with me? So, when he started the parable, he told them, he said, there is a city. 
And in this city, there is a judge that does not know who, that does not know God. And you see, the exact thing Jesus said actually is, is that this judge, this, this judge in this city does not fear God. Are you with me? So the question is, if, if, if a man does not fear God, what is likely to be the cause? Does it mean that the man does not know God? You see, when we talk about knowing God, it's in dimensions. Are you with me? There's a knowing that is intimate. There's a knowing that is not intimate. Are you there? When you know him intimately, you fear him. Are you there? When you know him intimately, you what? You fear him. So the fear of God is a sign that we have known him intimately. What I mean by intimate, intimately is that now we know him more closely. We know him in a more deeper dimension. Are you with me? So the Bible says in this city there is a judge that does not what? Fear what? Fear God. Now from that illustration we know that in this city we have a judge that does not know God what? Intimately. So from here, we now know why this judge does not fear God. If the knowledge of God you have is not intimate, it cannot translate into the fear of God. Are you with me? That's it. Now let me give you an example. For instance, if all you know about a teacher is that a teacher is somebody that comes to the class and writes on the board, if that's all you know, that knowledge is not intimate. Are you with me? Because you may, you, you may also need to know another dimension of that teacher. Because the same person that writes on the board can also discipline you when you are wrong. Are you with me? So when your knowledge of a person is intimate, it projects fear in you. Are you there? So I'm taking my time to, to stress this because I want us to know why this judge does not fear God. Are you with me? And also, you, if you know this, then you know why some so-called Christians do not also fear God. Your knowledge of God must be intimate for it to produce what? Fear. Are you with me? All right. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded what? Man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my what? Of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear what? Not God. Nor regard what? Regard man. Now look at this. Because the, the, the judge does not fear who? God, he did not regard man. You get what I'm saying? The, the, the level of honor you can give to men is resting on the fear of God that you have. Are you there? The degree of the fear of God that you have is what translates into your honor for men. So a man that does not fear God cannot honor men. That's it. So this judge does not fear God, neither does he what regard men. Now we know why he does not regard men. He, he has no regard for men because he had no fear for God. Are you getting what I'm saying? So if you don't fear God, you cannot honor men. Even if, especially if they are men of God, you will hate them with passion. Do you know why we love people of God? Do you know why we honor men of God? You see, the honor we give to ministers is the honor we have for God. Are you getting what I'm saying? The fear we have for ministers is the fear we have for God. Are you getting what I'm saying? If, if you are doing something and somebody says, this thing you are doing, I'm going to tell pastor, you know? and you say, well, 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 even if you tell him, it's none of my business. That thing you are doing is pointing to the level of fear that you have for, for God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because the honor you can give to ministers is equal to the honor you have for God. Are you there? And a man that does not honor God will not regard 
men. See, these are principles you must understand. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't fear God, but I honor men, is a lie. Are you with me? All right, let's continue. Yet, because this widow, what? Troubleth me, I will avenge her. Lest a continual, what? Coming, uh uh-huh, where is me? Now look at this. He now said, though I do not fear God, and because of my lack of fear for God, I also do not what? Do not regard men. But this widow has been coming to me continual, what? Continually. And because of her continual coming, I will need to attend to her need so that she will not what? Weary me. And you get what I'm saying? You see, don't forget the topic is the sure mercies of David. So this judge now decides to attend to the case of this woman because she had been coming to him, what? Continually. That word continually now can be likened to consistently. Are you there? Hmm. (laughs) Now, let's bring God into the picture. Are you with me? Let's bring God into the picture. Then we begin to, we are about to travel now. But I need to lay some blocks because if I go straight into the rivers and I don't lay these blocks, you may not understand what I want to teach you. Now let's bring God into this picture. This judge now is now representing God. Are you with me? And this woman that has been coming to the judge continually is representing we Christians. Are you with me? So it now means that if we are consistent in going to him, are you there? In seeking his face, our consistency can move God to do something. Are you with me? Okay. This is where mercy comes in. You see, God does not have a weakness. Hmm? God does not have a a deficiency. But you see, there is something about God that makes it look as though God is subject to man. And that aspect of God is the mercy of God. Are you there? Hmm? If your consistency that's a result. It's a sign that it has touched the mercy of God. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's it. You can put your head down and knock it and knock it and die. It doesn't affect God. Are you with me? So when we begin to talk about consistency, are you there? You must begin to see mercy. You see, your consistency in itself does not have power until it touches the mercy of God. It is mercy that makes God respond to your continual coming. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now look at this widow now. If she keeps on coming and coming and the judge refused to do anything, what will happen? Nothing. Are you with me? It doesn't take the judge anything. The judge can say, all right, Please, this woman, anytime she's coming, security guard, arrest her and throw her away. Am I right? It, it is in the power of the judge to order the, the officers there to arrest the woman. Are you with me? So if a continual coming now makes the judge decide to show her favor, it therefore means that that continual coming has touched something in the judge. And that is the mercy of God. Are you with me? You see, God is a king. And because he's a king, you cannot move him. You cannot make him do what he does not want to do. Are you with me? That's it. You see, there's a way we can teach this thing and people will believe what we are saying. But yet we are not accurate. Are you with me? For instance, now, somebody can come up and say, Well, if you continue to ask God and ask God and you are asking him, God, we have no choice. No. 
if your continual asking is going to produce a result, then it must have touched what? Mercy. Because the one you are talking to, whether it does it or not, it doesn't affect him. Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you with me? Hmm. Remember, we are, we are teaching on what? The sure mercies of David, right? So when your consistency touch the mercy of God, it produces what? A result. Are you with me? The, 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 the dimension of God, the aspect of God that makes God subject to a man is his mercy. So when God begins to relate with a man by mercy, it looks like that man is, is, is it, it looks like God is now subject to that man. But if you are not careful, you think there's something special about you. No, it's mercy. It's relating with mercy. Are you there? When God begins to relate with you by his mercy, it looks as if he is now subject to you. It looks as though if you are not there, he cannot do anything. It's mercy. Are you there? This is what many people have misinterpreted. They are now saying, God cannot do anything without you. It's not true. There are many things that God can do without you. Are you with me? There are many things that God can do without me. As a matter of fact, there are many, many things that God can do without us. Who is God taking permission from before bringing the sun? Huh? Who is he taking permission from before the night will come and the day will come? There are many things he can do without the involvement of man. Are you there? So when it looks as if God cannot do anything without man, is a sign that God is relating with what? Mercy. Are you getting what I'm saying? So in the Bible, God said, how will I do this thing without telling my friend who? Abraham. So you can come and come and teach Rem and say, yeah, there's nothing God can do. No, it is mercy. When God begins to relate with you by mercy, there are many things God will not do until you are involved in it. God can ask a whole generation to wait because he's still waiting for it. It is the mercy of God that makes it look as though out of everyone in your family, you are, you are the most special. It's mercy. It is mercy that will pick last born and skip one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and come to the last one. It's mercy. Are you getting what I'm saying? If God is doing anything special with your life now, it is what? Mercy. That's what makes us special is God's mercy. Anytime He shows you mercy, you look special. That's it. Anytime God shows you mercy, you look what? You look special. There is nothing special about you. There is nothing special about you. There is nothing special about you. Anytime God shows you mercy, you look special. That's it. Are you getting what I'm saying? So you are here now. Learning from the feet of the master. Whereas you have a lot of mates out there who are still lost. Are you there? Who have not come into the light of God's word. What's the difference between you and those people? Mercy. So God wants to do something in your family. He comes to you and shows it to you. What is that? It's mercy. If we don't understand all these things, we'll begin to make a lot, we'll begin to teach a lot of things that is not wrong, that is wrong, I mean. And people will think it's correct because you, you can link it to things that is visible. Are you with me? Never join people to believe that if there's no man, God will not do anything. It's not true. It's just mercy that makes it look good. Are you with me? Now let's try. The sure message of what? Follow me carefully. In this teaching, I'm going to show you some extra biblical facts. When I say extra biblical fact, I'm talking about things that you will, you cannot find in the Bible. Are you there? There are there are extensional works of research. Are you there? 
You won't find it in the Bible, but it's part of it. Are you with me? So now let's let's journey. This journey will begin from. Uh, we're going to start this journey with Boaz and Ruth. If you study the Bible in the book of Ruth, you discover that uh, Naomi had two sons, right? And one of them married Hopha, the other one married Ruth. Are you there? At a point, the husband of Ruth died. Are you there? And the two sons of uh, the husband of Naomi died, and the two sons of uh, Naomi also died. So Ruth became a widow, and Opa also became a what? A widow. So Naomi decided to go back to his homeland. You know, Ruth said, I will follow you. Opa said, I will follow you. To cut the long story short, Opa went back. But Ruth, what? Followed him. Followed her. So when Ruth got to the place, Ruth now took up the responsibility to ensure that her grandmother is well fed. So she would go out to glean and come in the evening to feed her grandmother. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? So she now, she now took Naomi as, as what? As her mother. Are you with me? Meanwhile, Ruth is a Ruth is from Moab. Are you there? Ruth is from what? Yes, she's a Moabite. Are you with me? Oh, um, no. Let's. This is for Ruth, right? Ruth is from Moab. So she's a Moabite, right? Okay. But Boaz. Boaz is um, Boaz is a Hebrew. Are you there? So when you hear the word Hebrew, we are, they are referring to the Israelites. Originally, they were called the Hebrews, but at a point, the name changed to the Jews. I get what I'm saying. So when you hear Hebrews, they are still referring to the Israelites. When you hear Jews, it's still the same thing. Are you with me? So at a point. Boaz, this thing I'm saying now, I've not gone out of extra biblical fact. This thing is in the Bible now. When I go out of it, I will tell you. What I'm saying now, you can see it in the book of Ruth. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. So at the point, Boaz now married Ruth. Are you with me? But this marriage had an issue. Because the, the Moabites, if you have studied the Bible well, you discover that the Moabites are this they are they are known for fighting the Israelites. Have you seen it in the Bible before? You see the, the Israelites went and fight the Moabites. They were the enemies of the Israelites. Are you with me? So there's a law that was made that the Israelites should not have anything to do with the Moabites. Because they were seen as the enemies of God. Are you getting what I'm saying? The only thing that can rob you of what God wants to do now is to choose to distract yourself. That's all. But if your attention is here and you are focused, you will get it. So, though to Ruth is a testimony that now she was, okay, she was a widow, now she's married, right? But to Boaz, it's not the same thing. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, though Boaz loved Ruth, but there was an issue. There were issues around them. People were not flowing with Boaz. This thing you have done is a taboo. We are not saying Ruth is not a, you know, she, she, we are not saying she's not a good woman, but she's a Moabite. Are you there? Those issues were there. Now, let's move to extra biblical facts. So, in further research, we now got to know that on the night of their wedding, on the night of their marriage, after they had the normal sexual intercourse, are you getting what I'm saying now? Boaz now died. So, by the morning, when they discovered that Boaz died, they said, yes, that's it. God has what? Judged him. Because he chose to marry from the forbidden land. Are you there? Meanwhile, that first contact between the two of them 
Are you there? God used it to put a seed in Ruth. So she conceived. But the people did not believe. They were like, they married, and the next day the husband died, and this one is now pregnant now. That means this child is a what? A bastard. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, the child that Ruth now gave birth to was called Obed. You can still find this in the book of Ruth. Are you with me? Hmm. Obed now gave birth to Jesse. Are you with me? This is still in the Bible. But it happens to be that this image, see, I want to see, what I want to do is the sure message of David. But you see, you cannot understand the sure message of David if you don't know the life of David. See, we are picking this thing from genealogy, from the, the ancestors, before we now get to David. So you will now know what the sure message of David means. Are you getting what I'm saying? Hmm. But these two, the Obed and Jesse, they suffered a kind of rejection, so to say. Because the people felt that they were illegitimate sons. Are you there? But one of the things they did was they now committed themselves to reading the Torah. Because at this time, the only thing that was available was the Torah. I hope you know what I mean by Torah. The first five books of the Bible is what is referred to as Torah. Genesis, yes. Exodus, yes. Leviticus, yes. Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. So they were committed to reading the Torah and they loved God. So at a point, they now became leaders, religious leaders. People saw them as spiritual, are you there? Spiritual leaders. Now, Jesse now married a woman called Nisbeth. Are you with me? Are you with me? This this Nisbeth was a Jew, an Israelite. Am I right? So he married Nisbeth. The marriage was going. Everything was fine. And this Nisbeth had, you know, she had a maid, a female maid, a a Canaanite. Are you there? A female maid who is actually helping her, you know, working for her in the house. So after some time, they had, in that marriage, they had seven sons. That's people like Eliab, are you getting what I'm saying now? The first son and the, and the likes. But after the seventh son, Jesse now began to doubt. He felt, what is happening? If I'm from a Moabite woman, and I, and I now married a wife that is an Israelite. Am I not also going against the rule? I get what I'm saying. You know, at this point, he had become a spiritual leader. Everybody already honored him. They were teaching the Torah. But he was now worried. Doubt began to set in. Am I not marrying a Jew? He now felt like, okay, this thing I'm doing now. If I'm from a Moabite woman and I married a Jew, Am I not polluting this, this woman? Are you getting what I'm saying? These seven sons that I have now, are they not illegitimate sons? By the law? Are you with me? And he loved Nisbet. So what he now thought of is, okay, what I'm going to do is, meanwhile, the only thing that they had then was what? The Torah. Are you with me? Now, looking at the Torah, he found a place where you know, in, if you look at the book of Genesis, you see how that Abraham went into the maid of Sarah. Are you with me? So he now thought within himself, okay, since my wife's maid is a Canaanite, if I still marry a Canaanite, are you getting what I'm saying? At least I know that it's different. There's nothing wrong. So he now thought of marrying his wife's maid the same way Abraham also went into Sarah's name. Are you getting what I'm saying? When the news now got to this Canaanite woman who was the maid of Nisbet, the wife of Jesse, 
Because this woman loved Nisbet, she was not willing to cooperate with Jesse. Not like the one in the Bible. Are you there? How that? No. This one was not willing to cooperate with Jesse. I get what I'm saying. But the thing was so strong, so strong that it got to Nisbet. So both of them now planned. No problem. They now did what Laban. Can you see that all this thing they were doing was still in the Torah? They did what Laban did to Jacob. He said, no problem. On that night, we will switch. I get what I'm saying. So on the night that Jesse came to have sex with this Canaanite woman, on that night, maybe he was drunk, they now switched. So the real wife, Nisbet, came to the bed. <laughs> this one left. I get what I'm saying. So they did something, she got pregnant. Are you with me? Now, when she got pregnant, meanwhile, after, you know, the doubt began to set in, after the seventh son, Jesse has stopped everything called sexual intercourse with this one. Because she is not doing it because of wickedness. He's just doing it because he felt he's polluting this person by law. So that means this pregnancy now is questionable. Are, are you with me? Because Jesse knows that he... Are, are you with me? So the Tommy began to shoot out. But it was only this niece base that knew what happened. That knew, okay, we actually did switch it, but nobody knew. It got to a point that the seven sons of Nisbet wanted to stone him to death because that child to them was what? A child of adultery. Are you there? And that child to them was a bastard. But Nisbet was not willing to expose the secret. Why? Because he wanted to cover the shame of, of her husband. Are you there? So when they were about to, they were accusing her, about to stone her to death too. Jesse also, because he loved Nisbet, came there and said, leave my wife. She is my wife, just leave us. I get what I'm saying now. But she kept the secret from her husband. Are you there? It was this pregnancy that now birthed David. The eighth son. You see that there was one mystery that was kept from the people, from the children, even from the father. The father did not know. And the seven sons did not know. So this pregnancy that was tagged as, you know, coming from adultery, is a bastard son, was what led to David. You know, the father did not know that he was the one responsible. And the seven sons were not aware. So when David was born, there was this great rejection that he suffered. If anything gets lost in the house, it is David. They wanted to kill him, but they had to do it in a legal way. So they now, they, he was this, the shepherd boy that David became was, he, he was forcefully. Because their hope was that at least <laughs> a bear will come one day and a lion will come one day to kill him. Are you there? This that I'm saying now explains why David was not, uh, was not numbered among the sons that were present when Samuel came to the house. You know when Samuel came to the house, all the seven sons were there except David. That's why. Because David was seen as a bastard child. Are you get what I'm saying now? If we now say, show mercies of David. Now, I want to start explaining what that concept means. But with, the reason I have to explain all this is because you cannot understand and appreciate the sure message of David if you don't know where David is coming from. Are you there? So David is not that son that though he was the last, you see, David was the last born. But the love for the last born he did not receive. Because of the taboo that was resting on him. The father was just dealing with him because of love. But the other seven sons were not aware, so they did not like him. Did you, did you see the way... Um, I get what I'm saying. So it was in this... These were the things that David passed through. Rejections. Mockery. As a matter of fact, sometimes they would gather and then begin to mock him. It became, a, it, it became an object of mockery in the house. Are you with me? For God to now come to that family and skip one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven. Then to pick eight. That can only be by what? Now, why do we why do we say the sure mercies of David? Are you with me? It is the sure mercies of David because the life of David enjoyed mercies. You see, can you see that the mercy there is not singular? Is what? Is what? It's plural. Are you with me? Let's check the Bible. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 3. Now we can now look into the sure message of David now. We look at what it means. Yes, Isaiah 55 verse 3. Isaiah 55 verse 3. Yes, if you are there, you can read loud. Yes, you can give her the mic. Yes. 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 Can you come again? Let her come again. Yes. And come unto me. Yes. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Thank you. So it therefore means the first thing to note about the sure message of David is one, the sure message of David is an everlasting covenant. Are you there? That's the first point to note. The sure message of David is what? It's an everlasting covenant. When we say that a covenant is everlasting, what does it mean? It means that the, 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 the length, the lifespan of that covenant is beyond the one that received the covenant. That's what it means. When we say a covenant is everlasting. Are you there? The lifespan of that covenant is what? Huh? Is longer than the one that received what? The covenant. Meaning that even the generations after the person will still what? Come into the benefit of what? Of that covenant. Are you with me? The sure message of David is what? Number one. And what? An everlasting what? Covenant. Praise God. Now, number two. The sure message of David is Is, is a unilateral covenant. Are you there? Yes. It's a unilateral covenant. I'm going to explain what I mean by unilateral covenant. Are you with me? There are two types of covenants that God can make with a person. The first one can be unilateral covenant. The second one can be a bilateral covenant. Now, if the covenant is unilateral, what it means is that you don't need to do anything to keep it. The one that is making the covenant with you, we see that he continues to meet up with it. So whether you fall into or you, eh, the covenant still keeps on going. Are you with me? But in a bilateral covenant, in a bilateral covenant, the one that is making the covenant with you has a part to play, yes. And you that you are receiving the covenant, you will have a what? A part to play. And because the sure message of David is a unilateral covenant, that was why the the, the you know the mistakes of David could not cancel the covenant. Are you there? Do you know it was David that killed Uriah? Eh? Uriah was faithful to David, yet what David was killed. David was about to die in the book of First Kings, I think chapter 1. David was still telling Solomon, I think chapter 1 or chapter 2, he said, Solomon, by your wisdom, uh, this boy, Shimai, was making jest of me while I was, how many of you have read that place? This boy, Shimai, was making jest of me while I was in trouble. Make sure he does not go to the grave. Not only that, you have to say, please, uh -huh. this Joah has offended me. Make sure he also does not go to the grave. What? Look at those things. Yet the covenant is what? 
You see, one of the now, before I continue with the consensus of the short message of David, let me show you the contents of this message. Are you there? The short message of David. I'm going to show you how this message now relates with you. Because what I'm doing now is just like I'm just teaching you theology or something. I'm going to bring you to how it relates with you, how you also come into the short message of David. Are you with me? But before then, look at this. One of the content of the show messages of David. Meanwhile, anytime you hear show messages of David, just know it's a covenant. The show message of now let's define it. What is the show message of David? Are you there? The show message of David is God's covenant of mercy with David. It's what? God's covenant of mercy with who? With David. So when you hear the short message of David, you, you know that the Bible is referring to what? God's covenant of mercy with who? With David. I get what I'm saying. Have you read the Bible before and you find a place where the Bible says, God kept mercy. I will keep mercy for you. Huh? Huh? Now, if you, if, you, if, you, if you come into this covenant, God will keep mercy for you. There's a way God keeps mercy for people. <laughs> are you getting what I'm saying? You may not understand. If you are under this covenant, God keeps what? His mercy for you. He reserves mercy for what? For you. So one of the content of this covenant is kingship, rulership. What do I say? Kingship and rulership. I'm going to show you. You see, after David died, who came up as king? Solomon was his son. Solomon misbehaved. And because of the shortness of David, the kingdom of Israel was divided. See, what God was supposed to do was to blot out the entire family of David and bring another person to rule Israel. But see, may you enter into the covenant of God's mercy. Stretch your hands, stretch your hands. In the name that is above every other name, because you are here, and to those who are also watching us, and to those who will listen to this message later, as you hear me, I speak to you by the Spirit of God, that from today, you will enter into the covenant of God's mercy, in the name of Jesus. Now look at this, look at this. When you come into this covenant, there is nothing God cannot do for you. He can divide a nation because of you. When Solomon came up and he misbehaved, what was God supposed to do? God was supposed to remove Solomon, right? And go and start kingship from another family. Do you know what God did? Instead of counseling the, the lineage of, of David, do you know what God did? God allowed the nation of Israel to divide. I'm going to raise king from his seat. So, I will divide this, this nation. So, Israel now divided into two. Ten. So, one had ten tribes, and one had what? Two tribes. So, God now gave two tribes to what? The lineage of David. And gave ten tribes to others. Meanwhile, at this point, David is supposed to have what? Zero. Look at that. The height of mercy. God dividing a nation because he wants to keep a covenant with one person. See, when you, when God makes covenant with you, <laughs> you don't know the weight of that thing. May God make the covenant of mercy with you in the name of Jesus. So I said, one of the content of the short message of David, one of the content of this covenant is what? Kingship. Now look at this. The first king that ruled this tribe was Jeroboam. I want to show you the difference now. You see what happened to this one? Jeroboam. You see this in the book of First Kings. This Jeroboam did the same thing Solomon did. You know what God did? God wiped out his entire family. You don't understand what I'm saying? I will explain. 
When I say God wiped out his entire family, what I'm saying is he died. All his sons, his wives, the grandfather, the everybody died. This was the same thing that is supposed to what happened to Solomon. Because of this misbehavior of Solomon, the entire lineage of David is supposed to be wiped out. But what spoke for him? Are you with me? If you believe you are right, you miss mercy. Are you there? If you believe you have a point, you miss mercy. Hmm? Mm-hmm. If you believe you have what it takes, you miss mercy. If mercy will speak for you, it will speak in your state of humility. If mercy will speak for you, it will speak in your state of brokenness. If mercy will speak for you, it will speak in your state of submission to God. Lord, I am aware. I've come to the end of myself. There's still anything left. Please have mercy. Let me tell you something. If everything finishes, mercy is always there. So at the point where there's nowhere to go, you can't turn, you can't face, you can't turn back, you can't turn later. What should you ask for? That one is always there. Okay. Can you pray a few minutes and say, Lord, have mercy? That's just the prayer for you. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Kai. Shabraha Dava Nanta Barada. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Kai. Jesus. Shabraha Dava Latoska Baba. In Jesus' name we have prayed. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Now let's check Acts chapter 13, verse 34. Acts chapter 13, verse 34. Oh my God. We must we must join in to God's mercy in this in this meeting. Yes? Yes. 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 I will give you the sure mercy of I will can you read it again? Read it again. And that he raised him from the dead. No more to return to corruption. No more to what? To return to corruption, yes. Yes. I will give you the sure Yes, thank you. Praise the Lord. He said, I will give you what? The sure mercies of David. Another thing to note about this sure message, number three, is it is a gift. It is a what? Mm. It is a gift. So we are going to make an order now. Amen. I will give what? I will give you the sure mercies of David. See, if you come into this sure mercies of David, it's not only for you. Are you there? Every generation that comes out of you will what? We come into that covenant. That's what I And you say, Father, give me the short message of David. In the name of Jesus. We have heard the word of the Lord. He said, I will give you the short message of David. Lord, give unto me the short message of David. In the name of Jesus, can you make it a prayer? Be very serious with it. Oh, Jesus. Have mercy. Have mercy. Give unto me the sure mercies of David. In the name of Jesus, give unto me the sure mercies of David. In the name of Jesus, give unto me the sure mercies of David. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Do you know why it is called mercy? The one that is doing you that favor has nothing to gain from the favor he's doing to you. It's mercy. Are you there? 
If the one that is doing you favor has nothing to gain from the favor is shown to you, it therefore means that what the person is doing to you is what? I can give you a pen because I want you to honor me. Are you there? That you have done to you is not mercy. Are you there? Mercy is what is done to you. Are you there? For you. It's done to you. Uh -huh. For you and for you alone. That's mercy. The doer is not gaining anything from it. You are the one gaining everything. That's mercy. There are some things we do, we refer to as mercy, but it's not mercy. So you gave somebody money now, and then the person is now honoring you. That's not mercy. You are gaining something. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's it. When God shows you mercy, he's doing that for you and for you alone. He's not gaining anything from it. It doesn't hurt to his status. Now, how do you come into the sure message of David? That's it. Since we know now that it's a gift, how do we come into it? How do we, how, how do we come into this covenant? How do we enter into this covenant? Are you with me? Look at this. There's a song we do sing. Abraham what? Blessings, Blessings are mine. Look at this. When you come into Christ, are you there? When you come into Christ, you come into promises. Are you there? And because you have come into Christ, you can access, you can come into the fulfillment of certain promises that have been made. Are you there? By the Lord. And every promise is resting on a covenant. Are you with me? Look at this. When you come into Christ, the sure message of David is open to you. But that it is open to you does not mean you can access it. Are you there? There's a place of you seen. Are you there? Look at. When you come into Christ, all that you need for life as, and godliness has been given to you because. Everything God wants to give to you, He has given to you in Christ. But, <laughs> the numbers of things you will now enjoy is resting on how far your eyes can what? The Lord was speaking to, I think, Abraham. He said, as far as your eyes can see, I will give to you. That's the same instruction God is giving to everyone that is in Christ. As far as your eyes can see in Christ, I will what? Give to you. So can you see, is the showman of David, is it visible to you? Huh? Once it becomes visible, it becomes accessible. Are you there? Once it becomes what? Visible, it becomes what? So through this teaching now, God is making this covenant visible to us because he wants us to what? Access it. Say, Father, this covenant, the sure message of David, has been made visible to me. I receive grace to access it in the name of Jesus. Can you make it a prayer? Lord, it has been made visible to me. I receive grace to access it in the name of Jesus. I receive grace to access it, to access it, to access it in the name of Jesus. I receive grace to access it, to access it, to access it. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we are praying. See, we are going to pray a very serious prayer. Because for some of us, looking at the, the configurations of our families, you just know that you need the mercy of God. That's the only thing. But let me show you one more. Let me give you one more example. Then we stand, we pray. Because we must come into this covenant. We must come into it. By the grace of God. Now look at this. A man was caught in, in an act that is illegal. Um, he killed someone. And by the law, by the law of the land, do you know you are here, you are where you are now because a dimension of God's mercy was unveiled to you. I will, I will explain to you. Now look at this. 
I, I'm going to tell you in form of parable, then I'll now tell you the meaning of the parable. A man was caught in an illegal heart. He killed someone. And while he was tapping the person, meanwhile, there's a law in the land that whosoever kills will be killed. He was tapping the person. Oh, you made me got angry. You are dead. Oh, dead, oh, dead, oh, dead. And while he was tapping, the person, the person was, ah, you know, trying to suffer. The security officials, they came and arrested him. Are you there? They took him to the court. Based on the law, they caught him in the act. He cannot deny it. So they said, okay, this one should, should, this one should die by, what do they call this death? That they will tie them to a drum, then they will shoot them. Die by firing squad, right? So that was the judgment. So they took him outside. He was tied to the big drum. And then three soldiers were set, waiting for command before they start shooting. Are you with me? Then I said, and before we shoot, um, don't say your last word. You know they used to ask them to say their last word. Say your last word. The man said, said, Lord, if there is anything left, have mercy on me. That was the last word. He said, have mercy. Have mercy. I said, is that all? He said, yes. That's all. Then they give they said, okay, soldiers, get ready at the count of three. One, two, as they were about to say three, a man came. I said, stop, 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 stop. Now, let me die in the place of this man. They thought he was joking. Are you serious at all? This man came. They said, I want to die in his what? In this place. And they found out that the man was serious. So they lose that one that is asked for mercy and they tie that one there. They counted one, two, three. They said, say your last word. I said, I'm ready to die. That's my last word. I just want to die. They said, say your last word. They said, it is finished. What was his last word? It is finished. They counted one, two, three. Nothing of the sh- he died. That one that killed went to What spoke for the one that killed? Huh? The parable I just gave to you now is an illustration of what Jesus came to do on the cross. You were the one that sinned and you were supposed to die. But at the point of executing the judgment, Jesus showed up. The sign of God's mercy is Jesus. He showed up and said, instead of killing you, I will what? Be killed on your behalf. So you sinned the sin, but you went home without hurt. The one that was sinless now died in your place. That is what? That's mercy. There's something that is sure with God, and that is his mercy. When everything seems not to be working, and it seems you are finished, what should you ask for? Can we rise to our feet and pray? Can we rise to our feet and pray? I'm going to give you three minutes. Just find a prayer point. Whatever is laid in your heart based on what you have heard from the Lord today, just begin to pray. Find a prayer point. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Oh, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Have mercy on me. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. In the name of Jesus, establish a covenant of mercy with me. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. Oh, Kabaraba Natu Shabalaba. Are we praying at all? Establish a covenant of mercy with me. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. In the name of Jesus. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. Are you praying? Are you praying? <laughs> Is this how you pray for mercy? Oh my God. Le Kabaraba Bante Bereke de Balada Baragadaba. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. In the name of Jesus. Establish a covenant of mercy with me. In the name of Jesus. I will not miss your mercy. Oh, I come into the covenant.
covenant of mercy. I come into your everlasting covenant of mercy. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we are praying. Can you add more faith to this prayer and be mean what you are saying? Jesus was passing and a blind man who cannot see, he did not even see him. He did not see him. Maybe he just ask somebody, or maybe he heard people shouting, Hey, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He could not measure his distance from where Jesus was. Whether Jesus was far or Jesus was near, he did not know. All he knew was that he heard people saying, Jesus. What did he say? He said what? Jesus, son of David, have what? Mercy. Even when Jesus was far, mercy took his voice to where Jesus was. That's what mercy can do. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Hey, Kalabara Gadabalada. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. In Jesus' name we are praying. Can you add more faith to this prayer? Maybe there's something you need to see that will make you pray well. Now listen to me. A blind man cannot see. So he did not know where Jesus was. But he was, he was sure that Jesus was around. Thou son of David. Do what? Have mercy on me. Mercy took his voice closer to where Jesus was. One. Mercy made Jesus stop. Two. Mercy made Jesus walk. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus was walking with the multitude. Jesus stopped and walked back to where the man was. That's what? Mercy. It is mercy that will bring God to where you are to show you favor. That's mercy. There's no favor for you if there's no mercy for you. Are you there? Even the grace you enjoy came by the mercy of God. Lord, have mercy on me. In the name of Jesus. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. That's 
That's how to pray. That's how to pray. That's how to pray. That's how to pray. Hey, God. We're traveling from Lagos to Ondo. I was just a young boy, very small boy, maybe at the age of 14 or 15. And we got to the garage. We entered into the bus. And the bus was about to move. Suddenly, the mercy of God spoke. You know what the mercy did? The conductor now came to the bus and said, do you expect me to stand like this from Ondo to from Lagos to Ondo? No, but no way. Somebody must drop in this bus. And the conductor was pointing to me and my sister because I was just a small boy. I was sitting on my sister's leg. So my sister came down from the bus angrily. So we have to go and enter into an empty bus now. We did not know it's the message of God that is speaking. We enter into an empty bus and we are there back. We got to a spot, we now saw that a bus has fallen into the river. Everybody in, the, in our bus stopped. We looked into the river to see that it was the bus that we sat in. And mercy of God took us out. It's not for mercy, I will have been, I don't even know. That, that's the end of so for God. That's what mercy can be. Your salvation came on the strength of God's mercy. Jesus came by mercy. Can we pray for, for the last time and ask for God's mercy? Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, Jesus. that sword will never depart from his house. And then Jesus also came from that lineage. And while he was on the cross, you know, sword was used to pierce him by the sign. So the question is, was it because of that statement? Now the first thing I want you to understand is this. Um, Jesus was made a curse for us. Are you there? Because by law, curse is any cost is any uh, is anyone that is placed on the on the cross. Are you getting what I'm saying? Once you are nailed to the to the cross, you are already what you are cursed. That's what it means. To be nailed to the cross is to be cursed. That's by law. Are you getting what I'm saying? So when Jesus came, the appearance of Jesus ended all the curses. Are you there? But before he died, those things can still manifest. Are you there? So the, the sword that was used to pierce him was still pointing to that pronouncement that was made. Are you there? But after Jesus died, 
all the curses in that generation, in that lineage, ended. His death placed an end on them. Are you getting what I'm saying? But that was a sign also, pointing to that pronouncement. So he's right, he's correct. Next question. Yes. Okay, the difference between mercy and grace. Praise the Lord. Grace came by the mercy of God. Are you there? So, mercy comes first. Then, grace comes what? Second. Because God had mercy on us, then he showed us what? His grace. Jesus came by the mercy of God. And Jesus was grace personified. So that means it is the mercy of God that made grace to be available. I get what I'm saying. So mercy is the mother of grace. So if God have mercy on you, He will show you His grace. Are you getting what I'm saying? So that's it. Yes. Next question. Yes. All right, this is a very sensitive question. When God makes a covenant with you, how do you know if the covenant is a unilateral covenant or it is a what? It is a bilateral covenant. Praise the Lord. You will know why the covenant is going on. Are you there? You will hear things like, if you uh, do this, I will what? Do this. That one is conditional. That one is bilateral. If God is saying, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, when it says, if you will obey and are you there, then I will do all this. Are you there? But if you will do otherwise, this is what will happen. When God is making a covenant with you and is telling you, if you will do this, I will do this. If you, will, if you don't do this, I will not do this. That is bilateral. But if he's not giving you those conditions, are you there? One of the common vocabulary that God uses when establishing a, a bilateral covenant is the word if. Are you there? Yes. You see him using the word if. If you will do this, I will do That's bilateral. But if it is not bilateral, if it is unilateral, it doesn't use that word. If will not appear there. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's it. Any other question? Any other question? Do we do we have? Okay, can we rest to our feet? Can we rest to our feet? Tanu to Benga because Baba Loke Tanu.
moves for me. Jehovah, oh look, lift your voice, hey.
into the week with this song. You see, um, the Lord has taught us on the sure message of David. This is one of the ways to enter into that covenant of mercy. You begin to chant the song. You begin to chant the song. As you journey through the week, you begin to chant the song. And as you begin to sing it, you begin to see it. As you sing, you see. You see. Can we thank God for what he has done today? Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Ravine Koba Rabba Bande Brehi Govala Daba Rabas Kabrambo Baba Bira Dabas Kebrehi Dabas Irraba Baba Baba Leberu Govala Daba Ridas Eka Kabrambo Baba Bande Brehi Dabas Rabin Kovala Bande Brehi Kabaraba Irraba Baba Lava Rada Balaba Anu Walio Waleto Wa Ari Rebalo Do Baba Jesu Waleto Wa Thank you, Lord, for this song. Thank you, Jesus. Irabas kebaranda ba kemenento si kabalaba. Irabida ba rada la ba la ba rada ba la da. Irabada ba da ba da ba da ba. Anu wale o wale to mi o e ka. Mori le ba la da. Now look at this. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Somebody will be chanting the song during the week. Don't be chanting the song. Don't be chanting the song. And you see a message on your phone, and that's all. That, <laughs> that message will now be the answer to the prayers you have been praying for long. Because as you begin to chant the song by the Spirit of God, things will begin to fall in place. Everything will begin to come together for your good. Make it your anthem for this week and see what God will do. Father, we thank you for this gracious hour. Thank you for the song of the Spirit that you have given to us again. We believe that with this song, we are going to fly. We believe that with this song, we are going to touch a lot of goodies in you. Father, we say, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone that is here today, by the mercies of God, you will enter into the sure mercies of David in the name of Jesus. Amen. God will make a covenant of mercy with you. Amen. Amen an everlasting covenant with you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. He will keep mercy for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you Father. Amen. Let your name be praised. In Jesus name we are praying. Can we jump our hands together?